Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, Bruegel event. Um, today uh, we are uh, presenting a book on monetary policy in times of crisis, a tale of two decades of the European Central Bank. Uh, this is a book uh, that has been prepared by um, authors uh, at the uh, ECB, uh, Massimo Rostagno, Carlo Altavilla, Giacomo Carboni, Wolfgang Lemke, Roberto Motto, Art uh, Fan Guillen, and Jonathan Yangu. And uh, today we are lucky enough uh, to have two uh, of uh, the authors uh, of uh, this book uh, presenting, uh, specifically Wolfgang Lemke, uh, who will do the um, first presentation, and Massimo Rostagno, who will participate into uh, the discussion. Um, I am uh, moderating uh, this uh, event, uh, but uh, together with uh, Petra Gerat from uh, Cambridge University, I will also um, discuss uh, the book. Uh, we will try to keep uh, enough time for question and answers uh, that uh, you are very welcome uh, to put on a slido. Uh, the code word uh, to enter your questions is monetary. And I will try to have a look at slido and, and put forward uh, the questions uh, that uh, you will have uh, uh, written into it. Um, I can uh, just uh, add uh, that uh, the book uh, has been published uh, and for a small fortune, uh, you can buy um, uh, a paper copy. Um, maybe the fortune will have to be a bit smaller, but not that much smaller if you are content with the um, uh, internet uh, version. Uh, now, without uh, further ado, um, I would just uh, uh, ask uh, Wolfgang to start. Um, I would kindly ask him to keep his presentation to 20 minutes. Uh, and then uh, uh, myself and Petra will come uh, with the seven minutes each, uh, and, and then we will have uh, the, uh, the discussion with the, uh, with the audience. So, uh, Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Francesco, for this warm words of welcome, and thanks for Bruegel for, for having us, and it's a pleasure to present our book in this uh, esteemed audience. Uh, let me try to uh, share my slides here. Uh, Francesco, can you confirm that you see it? Yes, indeed. Excellent. So, um, yeah, great to be here. Uh, great to also see, looking forward to Francesco in the double role of our discussant, uh, besides uh, Professor Ferrat. Uh, that's, that's a pleasure already now to have them here. Um, the usual disclaimer applies. I mean, this is a book by ECB staff about the history of the Euro and in particular the ECB. But still, this is our work, so um, this is uh, does not necessarily reflect the views of the ECB or the Euro system, and the same holds uh, for the presentation. And also, we will not talk about current policy, which is interesting enough, but uh, today we focus on the backward look in perspective of the 20 years that we cover in the book. So why write a book? So for academics, it's standard to write papers uh, for central bankers in monetary policy as we are. It's also common to do, to write papers if we find time, less so books. And uh, Francesco's book is an exception. Our book is one. And maybe a few words how it came about. So it was 20 years of the euro approaching in 2019. And so we started under the leadership of, of Massimo to, to write a paper. And we quickly saw that paper, paper grows out of proportion. If you want to cover the 20 years exciting history of the euro, until that point, you needed more space. So it was a super long paper, and at some point it was a book in quotation mark, and then it became a proper book. And um, as uh, Francesco already um, enumerated the authors, we are all from the ECB, most of us from the monetary policy department, and one from the council to the board. So the book is an insider perspective. And an insider perspective necessarily comes with a con in the sense of if people ponder to, to buy the book or not, they will say, look, this is an insider perspective. Uh, what can they tell about uh, ECB monetary policy other than that it was very successful? On the other hand, insider perspective has a big pro because we are in this privileged position to give a real-time description of decision-making, and it says there on the slides, but this is even in the accounts of the ECB, right? So there it's written how the council debated certain issues. But we also give an insider uh, perspective on decision-making preparation really the what's going on behind the scenes in the monetary policy department of the ECB discussing measures to be set out to bring inflation where it should be. And when I say monetary policy department, this is our more narrow focus. Of course, the whole bank was involved and we also managed 
to mention other departments like Francesco is back then, the marks operation, Greek, legal, and, and so forth. But the focus is from our perspective. And the style of the book is also specific. So you can read it as a kind of a, um, as, as a just a, uh, like a novel. So it, we, we try to have a common narrative throughout. But as we are all like quantitative economists, this is a, it's an odd mix of a novel. So it's a narrative from the day of the birth of the euro until the end of 2018. But in between, you have deep drill econometrics, models, data that try to substantiate what we say. So in this sense, it's a thing of a, of a unique thing. And uh, so it speaks to readers who just want to give an overview, but also to economists who want to deep dive into how the ECB staff analyze certain things over time. Uh, some of the things in the books are new in the sense of it's not just a collection of uh, existing material. We had new analysis in the book on past things, so decomposing events into their structural drivers, but also on most recent non-standard measures. So how did QE work? Was it good that the ECB put out negative interest rates and the like? And you know, the ECB recently had its second strategy review under the uh, leadership of President Lagarde. And this book was naturally one input to the strategy review, but not the input in terms of, okay, this is the stock taking of what we did. It's our view, our contribution, but it was one input to the strategy review. And um, yeah, so without further ado, let me jump into the book. I mean, this is uh, 400 pages and I have 20 minutes. So you can, you can do the accounting. It's not possible to present the book in full. So I will uh, be a bit eclectic and selective. But before I do so, let me um, gloss over the, the overall structure. So if you're interested in the book, as Francesco said, if you're a scholar or an academic, you can even read it for free on the Oxford uh, page, or you, you, can, you can look into this uh, in the library or buy it even, so the, the content. So it's the subtitle says it's a tale of two decades. And this is what the book is essentially about. It's the two regime story of the Euro. And as it is a backward looking thing, of course it starts naturally um, at the beginning even before the birth of the euro. So in this chapter, the foundations, we go back to pre-1999 and we look into how the founding fathers of the euro, politicians, but also the first governing council, how they shaped uh, what had to become then the first uh, common currency in, in, in Europe. So we look at things like the treaty prescribing that the ECB to be founded better looks at making sure price stability uh, is guaranteed. Then uh, the discussion of what how this concept of price stability has been filled with lies. Topics like central bank in independence are discussed there. Um, the discussion of the policy framework should be inflation targeting. I mean, back then, if you found a new currency area, you have a lot of predecessors around you. Yeah, you have the US, you have the national central banks. Um, we discuss how the DNA of the or the DNA of the new currency was was kind of filled with the input from the national central banks. And of course, a, a natural focus is on, on the Bundesbank position, for example. And then in chapter two, um, we go into um, the initial strategy of the, of the, of the new currency, uh, of the new monetary policy accompanying the, the new currency, um, the quantitative definition of price stability. I will talk more about it in a minute, uh, especially, and this is one of these um, Bundesbank inheritances, uh, the role of money. That had a prominent role, as, as you know, from the beginning. There was a so called two pillar strategy of the, of the central bank. Um, and we always, when discussing these things, we always kind of mirrored ourselves or the ECB back then through the lens of the critics. It's even in the title and its critics. So, one of the, of the critics we have today on board, uh, Petra Gerard, was a um, prominent co author of one of these CEPR reports that we frequently quite, uh, quote in the book, for example. So, we, we, we try to, with a, with a with the hindsight, of, of current position, we try to look back on what did they say, what did the ECB say, and, and what to possibly make of this. The third uh, section is a bit um, an application already of the strategy that was put out in the beginning, how that performed in action over the first 10 years, over that first regime of the euro. I will talk more about it in a nutshell. This was a regime with high inflation, supply side shocks, and the ECB struggling and, and fighting to get inflation below, uh, to keep inflation below 2%. Then the kind of the watershed of the, of the decades, not really time-wise, but event-wise was of course the financial crisis. And if this, is the Euro, if this is the Euro area, you don't talk just about the financial crisis, but the natural kind of um, sequence or the natural pair to, to discuss is of course the financial crisis together with the sovereign debt crisis 
that was specific uh, for the euro area. And there things get then really interesting because uh, having just key interest rates as a main policy instrument in the first part, the crisis unfolded a whole range of instruments that the ECB was uses uh, was used uh, were using uh, in order to fight the um, the challenges that came with the financial crisis in the transmission to monetary policy and uh, for the for the the headwinds for the aim to reach price stability. So we discussed things like uh, the operational framework. Uh, the famous or back then prominent uh, principle of uh, of separation, where the idea was back then that the, the key interest rate is still determining the monetary policy stance, so the overall orientation of monetary policy being loose or tight, while then special measures such as asset purchases were to make sure that this policy stance is transmitted to the economy. So one of these special measures in the sovereign crisis was the security markets program, and Francesco was one of the of the. Uh, one of the main figures be behind it back then. Um, there, of course, uh, OMT, whatever it takes, the famous uh, Draghi speech in London is there. And this is, I think, a, a good example. So everybody, if you Google it, whatever it takes, Draghi, you find a lot of things on the speech and, and what it brought about. But the book has a bit behind the scenes of the speech. So what was before? How did staff discuss um, whether we should do it? What about conditionality? So that gives some new flavor that I think is not written elsewhere. And then the second regime is the one on deflation risk. This is when the standard monetary policy instruments came to a, to, to the, towards the lower bound that the ECB needed to resort to alternative so-called non-standard measures, how we fought def deflation risk. I will also focus on this. And the sixth chapter is essentially an analysis how all these instruments play together in fighting the risks of, uh, of deflation or disinflationary scenarios. So I will focus a bit on three and six, but try to stay with a, with a high level overview. So let me jump directly to the foundation of the euro. And it's not uninteresting because we just had the second um, strategy review. So uh, 1998, OK, so the treaty was saying price stability. And the governing council said, let's define it to be operational and accountable. And they said price stability is that the HICP inflation index should not be below zero, should be increased. It should be below 2%. And all this should be reached over the medium term. This is the definition. It's not a choice like the inflation target or said, OK, 3% is, is maybe good. Here, it's, they said this is the definition. This is a kind of a time invariant principle, what it means to be price stability. And then in this first strategy review, the council said, this is still good. Let's stick to this definition of price stability. But in order to reach it, let's not be arbitrary. Let's say within that range, the 0 to 2%, we want a focal point. Yeah, And they said this focal point should be close to 2%, of course, from below, because above would violate price stability. And the reasoning of it was to have a safety margin to guard against the risk of deflation. That was very foresighted. There was no risk of deflation back then. Yeah, But theory and experiences elsewhere in history said, OK, this is something to be, to be watched at. And here you see an illustration of that choice of that, um, of that focal point. So the gray box that you see here is the range of what is the definition of price stability. So HSCP inflation between 0 and 2%. Now, where to put this aim in between? There's a bit of a trade-off, right? If you put this aim, again, in the range, say at 1%, and monetary policy is successful, then inflation shocks will make, um, make it so that inflation kind of ranges around this 1%, a bit below, a bit above, if monetary policy is successful. Is successful. Now, if you put... But then you may be very close to where you don't want to be, namely to the risk of deflation, where you run out of standard instruments and the like. So if you want symmetry, you are in the middle. If you want more safety, being away from the deflation scenario, you would be rather at the upper end, like the council decided, close to 2%. But then, of course, there are often shocks that threaten to bring you out of the price stability range. Yeah. So then you have an asymmetry here. So if you go a bit below your focal point, not too, not too bad because, uh, OK, you want to target it, so you want to bring it back there. But it's not so harmful as you're still in the range of price stability. But it's super harmful if you're above because then you leave your defined price stability range. So this suggests that there was an asymmetric reaction to monetary policy. And the book provides econometric evidence, data evidence, that this asymmetry was to some extent visible in the data. So this is essentially also our characterization of the first uh, almost 10 years of the euro. It was a regime of high inflation, 
Yeah, it was um, we had a lot of upside pressure on inflation. Supply side shocks were prevalent. The two percent inflation ceiling was always attacked. Yeah, so ECB monetary policy had to make sure that we don't exceed it for, for long. Over the medium term, we want to be below. The effective lower bound on policy rates, so that you cannot go like below zero if you don't do anything special, that was not relevant. Yeah, if inflation exceeded two percent, markets expected. We have some evidence that there's a strong reaction of monetary policy to fight inflation exceeding 2%. Inflation expectations we show in turn were quite relatively well in check. Yeah, so there was no strong risk of a de-anchoring. The second regime after the crisis roundabout was the exact opposite. I mean, this is stylized, right? It's economics, it's real world, but the stylized picture is, is the opposite. There were low inflation to be fought, shocks were often to the downside coming from the demand side. A 2% inflation ceiling was there, but not, not binding. The effective lower bound became the issue because inflation was low, deflation was threatening to come. There was the standard monetary policy instrument threatening to become to be bound at, at zero, and there was a need for additional instruments. And then if you are already at the lower bound with your standard instrument, then of course, if inflation threatens to be even lower, markets don't expect the central bank to be able to do so because of the binding effective lower bound. And then you have the risk of inflation expectations becoming de-anchored and there to be have a strong impact of realized inflation being low to trigger through to uh, inflation expectations. Now, let me jump into the second regime in 2014. Here, I don't go into detail. This is one of the analytical things in the book. It's a, it's a box plot. It shows various measures of realized and expected inflation from markets, from surveys and the like. And whatever the details here, the boxes show the distribution of inflation since the birth of the euro. And the red line is how inflation was in 2014. And it shows by all measures, by expectations, surveys, markets, our own forecast, inflation was super low and threatening to go even to, uh, towards, uh, towards zero or, or deflation. So the, current, the, the key policy rate at the same time was already at zero or even a, a tad below. So this was when the ECB thought, okay, we have to bring inflation back to where we want it. So close to but below 2% at that time. And there we had to resort to non-standard measures, negative policies, purchases of assets, private and public, forward guidance on rates and those purchases. And we had to re we resorted to our version of uh, funding for lending. This is a token that the Bank of England um, established for us. It was the targeted longer term refinancing operations where we um, gave particularly um, good conditions for refinancing banks in order to make sure they hand over these good conditions in their lending rates and, and lending volumes are supported. So with this package of non-standard measures, uh, the ECB tried to fight um, this disinflationary pressures in the second regime when we had the effective lower bound binding. And the book is then making a, a strong effort to, to find how successful were these measures. And uh, just maybe to anticipate, um, it is uh, what we find is um, not too different from what, what academic studies find, for example. But what's special compared to academic studies that we as central bankers, we didn't want to just focus on one particular aspect. So what's the effect of negative rates or what was the effect in a certain point in time? So we as a, as a monetary policy department, we're interested in the full package, the different instruments on the full macroeconomy and financial markets. This is usually not an academic thing, what, what they look at. It's, it's, they focus more on identification, certain aspects, but we needed to have the, the full package assessed, and that's what we tried. So just to give you an example here, this is the effect of non-standard measures on the yield curve. The punchline is without non-standard measures, interest rates would have been higher. So here, right, group 2018, I hope you see my mouse moving, 10-year rate was compressed by more than 1.3 percentage points through our non-standard measures. And you clearly see the blue bar, this is our asset purchases, uh, has contributed the lion's share of this yield decrease. At the short end of the curve, this is different. Green and red bars are prominent. Blue is just one third. This is negative interest rates and forward guidance. So at the short end of the curve, the other two policies, negative interest rates, abbreviated with NIRB, and forward guidance were making the bulk of the contribution. As a corollary, of this type of analysis, you needed a mix of instruments. In other places, we, 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 we um, explore it in more detail, but this is um, one finding of, of our, our, our um, explorations. 
Then, of course, uh, we don't stop short at analyzing what's the impact on financial market on the yield curve as a, as a key token of the financial conditions. But we went further and said, so what's the impact on what we want to achieve, namely inflation in the end? And so here is the impact on GDP growth and inflation. The solid blue line shows you how inflation and GDP growth did in actually over those four years or five years from 2014 to 2018 when the book stopped. You see that um, the um, GDP growth was almost 2%. Inflation was then at the beginning in 2014, that was also my chart before, very low, bordering negative. And the dashed line is where would have been growth and inflation without our measures. So for 2018, when measures were accumulated already, you see an impact of almost one percentage point on growth. You see an impact of almost half a percentage point on inflation. But in 2016, you see even here, we uh, prevented, if you take this face value, um, the risk of sliding into deflation. So here it was really needed to come up also with the APV, the purchase program, in order to prevent inflation sliding into negative territory. So I'm almost done with my 20 minutes. Um, so I'm watching my time, Francesco. So just to sum up the main messages of the book, so very telegraphically. So we, the book looks at two decades and two inflation regimes, one with low inflation in the second part, high inflation in the first part, and with different challenges to monetary policy. The ECB price stability definition worked effectively under the first regime. So um, the 2% ceiling was important to be there in order to make sure in terms of expectation management, this is what the ECB would not tolerate if inflation goes, goes above it. Under the second regime, the 2% ceiling became less relevant, but the uh, lower bound to interest rates became more relevant. And when we went there in order to prevent inflation sliding down, uh, we need to resort to negative interest rates, forward guidance, asset purchases, and these targeted long-term refinancing operations in order to make sure that inflation is brought up towards 2% again. So yeah, this is uh, 400 pages in 20 minutes. So that was, as I say here, a bit of the tale of the two decades told. Um, yeah, in the, in the preface, we write something bold, assertive. For the first 20 years, we offer a clear demonstration of how a central bank can navigate macroeconomic and security in crisis. Okay, that's quite bold. It's uh, <laughs> from ECB authors. Interesting is this apocryphic type of earlier draft that you don't find in the book. When we're done in the end of, uh, so in the 2019, 20, or 2019, looking back to 18, we said, well, it could be worse. There could be more extreme scenarios in which the economy sinks in even deeper recession and more lasting contraction. We didn't see the pandemic coming, yeah? So it was uh, a bit clairvoyant style that there could be something worse and something worse came. And here we said, well, if this comes, it would be good if other policies, not only monetary policy can come to the rescue because the whole, the whole lot of the book is about monetary policy needed to step in into branches where, where it didn't belong originally because there was no good framework in terms of crisis prevention, crisis fighting yet. So we hope for the next crisis, there would be a, a better interplay and a better support also from other policy areas. And we think, yeah, in the Corona crisis, that was to a large extent uh, fulfilled. So thanks again uh, for your attention and um, happy to see your discussion and, and questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. I think uh, that was uh, really a sign of progress that you managed uh, to uh, concentrate in, in, in 20 uh, minutes uh, the gist of these uh, 400 pages uh, that, uh, that you have written with your, with your colleagues. Um, maybe you can, okay, um, stop share screening. Um, and I will uh, change hat now uh, and uh, start uh, as a, a discussant. Um, and um, I will uh, share my screen for this. Just bear with me a minute. Voilà. Already Christmas on your desktop, I see. Yeah, just a second. Uh, view. Uh oh. oh. Okay, uh, so um, I like the book. 
Um, uh, I like the book uh, for, 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 for some of the reasons uh, that Wolfgang uh, has, already, uh, has already mentioned. Uh, there is an admirable blend of historical narrative, empirical facts, economic and econometric analysis. Um, there is something that um, uh, Wolfgang did not say, but which I think is also important, that the book avoids uh, the trap of saying uh, that everything was perfect uh, and that the VCD didn't have anything uh, to learn. Uh, there are uh, mistakes uh, that are mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the book uh, in, 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 in a very honest way. Um, and also, and this is something that Wolfgang mentioned, there is an insight into the inner working of the ECB with frequent references to the staff. I mean, listening uh, to the um, press conferences uh, of uh, the various presidents of the ECB, you get the impression that uh, the ECB ends uh, with the governing council. Now, this book uh, tells you that this is not... Uh, this is not the case, uh, that there is uh, 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 a lot uh, behind uh, the uh, deliberations of the, uh, of the governing council. Um, I don't have uh, much time to go uh, further into this uh, good uh, aspect of the book, uh, and let me try uh, to uh, summarize uh, what I think is the most, uh, uh, the, the most important messages uh, of the book. And in order to do that, I take the Martian uh, approach. Uh, there is a Martian which comes to the Earth, uh, and he's given two pieces of information uh, to judge about uh, the 20 years uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the ECB. This chart here that gives uh, the level of HICP uh, since uh, the beginning uh, of the Euro and until now, this is the blue line. Uh, sorry, this is uh, the brownish line. Uh, then there is a trend of 2% uh, of HICP, uh, and then uh, there is a green uh, dotted uh, line, uh, which is uh, the two uh, trends uh, that actually prevailed in the first period, uh, the period without uh, a shape, and in the second period, uh, the period with a shape. And the other piece of information that the Martian is given is uh, that uh, net of some changes uh, in the definition due to uh, the 2003 and the 2021 uh, strategy reviews, uh, the task of the ECB, the objective of the ECB, was to keep inflation at 2%. Now, the Martian uh, looks at two, these two pieces of information and says, oh, it's these two periods are very different. A lot of success in the non-shaded part, uh, say until 2013, 2014, much less of a success uh, in uh, the later part, in the shaded part, uh, the, 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 the part after 2013, uh, 2014. Uh, and, uh, and, and now, uh, the uh, Martian uh, is given uh, another uh, piece of information, and the other piece of information that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is given uh, is um, um, the book uh, of uh, Massimo uh, and, uh, and colleagues. Um, and there, uh, the Martian understands uh, that he can just not compare uh, the first and the second period. They are very different. Uh, inflationary shocks on one side, deflationary shocks uh, on, on the other side, uh, and it's much more complex uh, than the Martian initially thought. Uh, and then the Martian is also given the book uh, that Thomas Van Limaki and I uh, wrote uh, two or three years ago, uh, and he finds out uh, that exactly around the time uh, when the uh, inflationary performance uh, of the ECB deteriorated, uh, the ability uh, of uh, moving interest rates uh, in order to pursue the uh, objective of price stability uh, uh, worsened a lot. Worsened a lot uh, because of the control of short-term rates uh, became more difficult because uh, at certain times uh, a very strong spread uh, appeared uh, between the very short-term rate uh, and the rates uh, that are more relevant uh, for the conduct of, uh, uh, of monetary policy and more importantly, uh, because of the effective uh, lower, uh, because of the effective lower bound. Um, now, uh, the Martian is then given another uh, uh, piece of information. This is a chart that has been uh, prepared by my colleague at Bruegel, um, uh, Zolt Darvas. Uh, in the red line, you find the actual behavior of core inflation. And in the little lines uh, that move uh, from that, uh, you have the projections uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the ECB. And you see clearly that the ECB kept thinking uh, and saying uh, that inflation would move 
uh, towards uh, 2 percent, uh, even if indeed it did not. Uh, and uh, so we are now uh, uh, some 10 years uh, with uh, uh, inflation uh, lower, uh, lower to than 2 percent. Um, and so uh, the Martian would say, well, maybe there is an issue of potency uh, of monetary policy. The Martian would not doubt uh, that uh, the ECB has done a lot, uh, has been very brave, has been courageous, uh, has gone out of its way uh, to uh, achieve uh, its objective. Uh, but uh, he would say, well, uh, they haven't managed that. And still they thought they would manage that year after year. Uh, and that was uh, uh, not uh, uh, that was not the case. Um, there is a, a charter that uh, Wolfgang uh, has presented uh, where the uh, actual results in terms of inflation, which is the main objective of the ECB, uh, from the forceful measures uh, taken from 2014 uh, onward. Uh, and you can look at it in, in different ways. Um, I look at it uh, in the sense uh, that it is a dispiriting bang for the buck. Uh, given all what the ECB has done, um, achieving one third of 1% more inflation is precious, but it's not quite enough. Um, and, and, and so uh, of the two stories about uh, inflation that are presented in the book um, in, in somewhat um, not fully coordinated way, one story is uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And the other story is you need much more than monetary policy in order to have monetary stability and uh, a thriving economy. Uh, my interpretation of the evidence of this book uh, is that we are closer uh, to the idea that uh, monetary policy is not quite potent uh, as uh, is uh, written in, in the book, as uh, the book, uh, as the book says. Uh, of course, I've thought of that the monetary policy um, is not uh, so the end of the story when it comes to inflation uh, is a dangerous uh, kind of thought. I realize uh, that. And I don't, I don't really know where I am uh, on, on these uh, two stories. But if I have one regret after having gone uh, through the 400 pages of the book is uh, that I'm not closer uh, to having uh, come uh, to an answer to this question, can uh, central banks really control monetary policy? or the, uh, sorry, uh, control inflation, or is uh, the inflation a story that goes very much beyond uh, the, uh, the central bank? I would have wished to, to find more about this uh, in the book. Um, and that's, uh, and that's uh, my uh, contribution to our, uh, to our discussion. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Petra. Okay. So I'll share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Francesco. And uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be contributing to this discussion uh, on European monetary policy, uh, covering lessons from the first two decades. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, um, regarding the book, uh, my view on it. Uh, so. Um, I am very much in agreement with uh, Francesco's views on it. The book provides a really rich description and analysis of ECB monetary policy during the its first two decades. And in my view, the, the main contributions of the book are first and foremost that it provides valuable insights into inside views and internal analysis. That is something that you usually do not have access to. Uh, so that makes the book really uh, valuable and worthwhile reading. Um, in addition, the book provides a very useful narrative, uh, that's where the tale in the title comes from, to interpret uh, and understand ECB monetary policy, both in terms of its strategy and its tools and the evolution in it. And third, the book presents new analysis based on quantitative models to support the narrative, and it estimates the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy tools that have been developed in response to the crisis. Uh, I would say, um, if you're thinking whether or not you should go and buy the book, this is absolutely essential reading for any ECB watchers. Uh, I must admit that if you're a non-specialist, you may struggle through some of the book because it uses quite some technical jargon. It does make an attempt to explain things, uh, but it is strewn with acronyms, uh, some of which are not immediately uh, explained. 
um, the introductory chapter uh, provides a, a very good overview and summary of, uh, of the book. Uh, and it would have been nice if the authors had managed to keep at least the introduction uh, non-technical uh, and accessible to a wider audience. So um, it is a bit of health warning if you go and read it, but for ECB watchers, it's a definitely essential reader. Now, um, so what I like about the book um, is that it's not just providing a narrative, it actually presents empirical analysis to support that. And the extensive empirical analysis helps to prevent ending up with narratives that are not really grounded in reality and that are like, a, like kind of fairy tales. Um, so um, what is the empirical analysis uh, like? So the main methodology is uh, to use a quantitative model, um, a particular euro area empirical version of the Cristiano Motram Rostanium model, which is um, a new Keynesian type DSGE model. And it's mainly used for shock decompositions, which can shed really useful light on the driving forces um, behind macroeconomic outcomes. And it also, um, the model is also used to do counterfactuals. And um, that is also really, uh, it can be really instructive, although it can also be very tricky to do that correctly. And in particular, um, how you deal with uh, things um, how you model the counterfactual is very important and you could easily end up with misleading results, especially if the model is not capturing everything that is, uh, that is relevant for economic outcomes. And one important part of that is, for instance, expectations. It's very difficult to provide plausible counterfactuals uh, for that. The second methodological tool is econometric analysis, uh, mainly using Bayesian bars. And it's used uh, for, for several uh, respects. Uh, now, um, in terms of the, the issues uh, for the empirical analysis, um, one thing that I'm missing in the book, um, in, in the analysis, is um, a, a thorough um, discussion of the robustness of the results. And um, one thing very, that's particularly noticeable is that um, the choice of the model that was used. So they used uh, the, the CMR model, as, a, as I, I call it. Well. It's, on one hand, it's not uh, surprising because two of the authors are also authors of the book. So that probably explains the, the choice for the model. Um, but uh, nevertheless, given that the book otherwise provides an inside perspective into ECB uh, monetary policy making, it would have been nice to also use the ECB's new area-wide model um, instead of the, the CMR model. And uh, one question is like, to what extent are the results presented in the, the book uh, robust to using the ECB's own new area white model? They're just more extensive uh, and a bit more sophisticated. And it would be useful to know whether or not the results are robust. The second issue is that uh, the analysis is quite extensive. There are lots of different things that are analyzed, but the analysis is often lacking many details. And um, that can hamper a correct interpretation of the results. And if you were trying to replicate any of the results, then it's actually quite difficult to do because, um, you know, for instance, like uh, for the counterfactuals, there's um, a broad description of what was done. Uh, so you have some idea of what, is, uh, what it is about. But if you wanted to know the precise details, they're just not there. So uh, it would be hard to replicate the results in the book uh, based on the description that is given. And in terms of like lacking details, um, another example would be like the significance of results is not routinely reported um, in, in tables or visible from graphs. Um, and if you see some confidence bands, you don't know what level they are. So unfortunately, the analysis is lacking many details. And um, uh, as a result, uh, when you look at the, the conclusions, uh, then uh, and you have a, a closer look at it. Um, when you look at the empirical results, they, they broadly support the conclusion, but when you look at it in greater detail, then the conclusions do not appear to be fully supported by the reported empirical results. Part of that is because um, details are missing in the way that the results are reported. Uh, and maybe if you had full information, then um, the, the conclusions would be supported, but it's very unfortunate that um, you're left with some doubts. Um, so, um, 
Of course, there's always a trade-off uh, in terms of like how much technical detail do you provide? You don't want to disrupt the flow of, of the argument, um, but a technical appendix where some of the details are um, put in um, that would have been a very valuable addition to the book and perhaps it can still be done online um, so that um, the authors share the, the nitty gritty details so that we can correctly interpret the results and would be able to replicate it. Um, so because of these issues, um, also the empirical evidence is uh, very suggestive and the empirical results that are presented in the book are not always persuasive. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. I wish that uh, the authors had uh, provided a bit more detail and um, looked more into the, the robustness of the results and made sure that the empirical results that they report are indeed supporting their and substantiating their conclusions. Okay, so now I will move on to what kinds of lessons can we learn based on the information provided in the book um, of the, the first two decades of the ECB. So I'll start with lessons from the pre-crisis period. The book provides a very good and critical review of the ECB's monetary policy strategy. Uh, the two pillar strategy was based on monetary and economic analysis. And as the book explains, it helped in the early years of the ECB to build on the Bundesbank's reputation to kind of inherit it. And um, also, the monetary analysis helped uh, to conduct policy in a highly uncertain environment that was data poor because the ECB um, had, um, was suffering from lack of data, um, Euro area data, it was uh, like recently constructed. There was not that much um, time series of it going back. And because of the European Monetary Union, it was an economy that was experiencing structural changes. Um, and the book argues that the monetary analysis uh, provided uh, useful indicators that made decision-making more robust. However, this two-pillar strategy, and in particular the monetary pillar, caused a lot of confusion, and it often complicated understanding policy actions, because uh, especially in the beginning, it was not clear which pillar was used when, and even after the review, um, in, in 2003, so then it was clear what the purpose was of each pillar, but um, even then it was uh, sometimes you were wondering like, um, why is the ECB moving now and why didn't it move before? Uh, it was just not always clear to understand the ECB's policy actions based on its strategy. And the monetary pillar in that respect really complicated things. Um, then the ECB's quantitative definition of price stability um, and its inflation goal of below but close to 2%. Um, as explained very well in the book, uh, the problem was it was fuzzy and asymmetric. And the book um, argues quite convincingly that that contributed to a decline in core inflation in response to persistent inflationary shocks because the ECB was responding to headline inflation, trying to keep that below 2%. And as a result, if you have persistent inflationary shocks, you end up with core inflation significantly below 2%. Now, in this respect, um, uh, the monetary policy strategy, the new ECB strategy with a symmetric 2% inflation target is a definite improvement. Um, and it will make things a lot easier for the ECB uh, because it's a symmetric target and it's still sufficiently away from the effective lower bound. Then let's move on to lessons from the financial crisis. Here, the ECB had to start resorting to unconventional monetary policy tools. Um, but the ECB used the different, uh, different tools instead of large scale asset purchases used by many central banks who adopted quantitative easing um, in response to the financial crisis. The ECB instead resorted to large scale liquidity operations through fixed rate, full allotment, longer term refinancing operations, these ultras. They had the advantage that they provided an easy way uh, to give ample and cheap, uh, flexible liquidity uh, for the banking sector. And it was flexible because it's um, refinancing operations, so it reverses itself automatically after the, the term, which could be one to even three years uh, in the case of ultras. Um, on the other hand, um, banks may not necessarily use the liquidity to uh, support the economy uh, through lending. Um, instead, banks may use it to buy government bonds, as the book actually um, provides some very interesting data on. 
And these government bonds, maybe euro area periphery bonds, that actually turned out to be quite risky. And as a result, rather than stabilizing the economy, these altruists may have actually contributed to um, greater financial fragility. ECB's solution, subsequent solution to this problem was that they came up with targeted altruists, these altruists um, that basically provided uh, more funding, the more lending the, the banks provided. Another drawback of these um, altruists is that it basically pushed the overnight interbank rate very close to the ECB's rate on its deposit facility. So the main refinancing rate of the ECB is no longer indicating its monetary policy stance. Instead, the ECB's deposit facility rate is a, a much better indication of the ECB's monetary policy stance. Um, and as a result, the ECB has essentially been engaging in monetary policy easing by stealth. The ECB was criticized for quite a while that it had interest rates at uh, 1%, but that was the main refinancing rate. And really, its deposit facility rate was at a much lower level, more in line with that of other major central banks. Um, so this is problematic, especially from a communications point of view. Um, because what people think is the main rate, the main refinancing rate, no longer indicates the monetary policy stance. And this is something that I've discussed before, in fact, at an ECB conference. Uh, and there, um, members of the, the governing council who were participating in the conference um, agreed that this was a problem. Um, the book does mention uh, that the ECB has been operating a de facto floor system, but it does not really acknowledge the communications challenges that this uh, gives um, and that it would be desirable as a result to um, move to a formal floor system or at least to clarify which of the key interest rates is really key uh, and indicates the monetary policy stance. Petra, um, I have uh, on Slido uh, some uh, audience that would like to, 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 to raise questions. Um, so I'm eager to come to the um, uh, question session. Yes. If you can yeah. conclude. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we move on to the lessons from the sovereign debt crisis. There, uh, we show the, the power of central bank communications. So Draghi's famous uh, whatever it takes uh, statement and the announcement of the outright monetary transactions program, they proved so effective that euro area periphery bond yields declined while the um, OMT program was still unused. This just shows like the, the magic of uh, like central bank communications. Um, but the sovereign debt crisis also showed that the euro area is still incomplete. Uh, it's a multi-country monetary union that faces fragmentation risk due to differences in spreads that are potentially self fulfilling. So a credible backstop like the OMT program is vital. And at the same time, we also, those, the EMU also needs a fiscal policy framework that combines both fiscal discipline with greater flexibility to respond to asymmetric shocks that hit countries. And that provides the, the space to engage in more public investment so that countries in the euro area periphery are able to, to catch up with the core. And the EMU also needs a proper banking union with effective supervision and resolution. So my last slide here is uh, lessons from the, the post-crisis period. There, ECB introduced negative interest rate policy. Um, the ECB's negative deposit rate facility had an expansionary effect, as the book shows. Um, on the other hand, it does effectively tax the banking system, and a solution to uh, mitigate this is to adopt tiered rates, which the ECB did in 2019. Another disadvantage of negative interest rates is that they could endanger financial stability through a search for yield. Um, and since it could um, cause an asset price bubble in, in the bond market, so effective macroprudential policy is also needed in this respect. Now, the book argues that the negative interest rate policy, the asset purchase program, the targeted ultras, and forward guidance have been complementary measures in the post crisis period and form an effective combined arms strategy. I agree with that, but I would go even further. Um, so the first three measures are clearly relevant when the um, monetary policy is close to its effective bound or in crisis mode. But forward guidance is something that can be very useful throughout, no matter what regime that you're in. Um, and uh, 
the, the book doesn't really you know, um, provide that much of a, and a recommendation in that respect, and I think that's, that's a missed opportunity. They greatly emphasize the importance of expectations management and stabilizing properties when it comes to inflation expectations. Um, and forward guidance can be equally useful in giving central banks greater control over longer term interest rates. So the ECB would benefit from greater transparency, including systematic forward guidance, better communication of risks with scenario analysis, and going back to a graph shown by Francesco with the, the, the spaghetti chart with the forecast all going up, that suggests that um, there may also be an issue with the reliability of staff projections. So the ECB would also greatly benefit from an annual evaluation of staff projections and of ECB monetary policy itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Petra. Uh, I know that Massimo has uh, to leave in a few minutes, uh, so I'm eager to give him uh, the floor. Uh, maybe Massimo, you can consider uh, a question that has come on Slido uh, from Marek Dabrowski, a, a, a colleague of mine at Bruegel, but shared by many others, who says that the deflationary decade of the 2010s uh, seems to be left behind. We face inflationary pressures again. How well is ECB prepared to address uh, this challenge? Uh, and this is very much uh, the uh, content of uh, another question in, in Slido. So the floor is yours and you may want uh, to, to cover this point as well. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Bruegel uh, organizers and um, a big uh, uh, expression of gratitude. Also on behalf of the other quarters who are not on the, on the call today. Uh, for, you know, for organizing this very nice event and for your nice words and for the, you know, uh, the time you took uh, Petra and, and Francesco to go through this uh, uh, heavy tome, uh, which as uh, Francesco softly noted, is not uh, precisely a uh, bedtime reading uh, for, for sure. So thank you for all that. Um, now, uh, let me, let me try to come to this uh, question that we got from, uh, from the audience um, in, a, in, a second, in a second stage. Let me uh, first um, uh, try to, uh, let's say, react to um, two very tremendously, in fact, important points raised by Francesco, but also indirectly by, by Petra, which is the following. Well, two, two points. One is uh, the intertemporal performance, no, in delivering inflation outcomes uh, over these uh, 22 uh, years of retrospective history. That's one. The other one is the role of other policies and, uh, and fiscal policy in particular, and the potency. In, 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 in reality, the potency of monetary policy. So on the first one, um, it's about, uh, I mean, the, if I had to you know, uh, crystallize the lessons of the central theme, thesis of this book, I would say um, it took 11, probably 12, probably 13 years for the public, the Europeans to understand the type of central banks that they had uh, in front of themselves, you know, that they had to, um, uh, to face. No, it takes always a lot of time. No, when you are in an institutional transition from one regime, monetary regime to another one, and the public has to learn the regime, the, the no fundamental parameters that regulate uh, monetary policy in that regime, it takes very, very long time in general. And in that time, that, la that lag, those lags are measured, measured in, in years, not in, in, uh, in, uh, in months. Uh, and we say it took um, 11 years, 12 years to understand that when the, the ECB, like Wolfgang showed, uh, wrote in, uh, in its uh, no, inaugural uh, <coughs> strategy statement that they wanted inflation to be below 2%, so that 2% was a threshold, was a pain threshold, not a central target. When they said that, uh, it really meant it, no? and it acted accordingly over the years uh, when challenged by all these uh, uh, oil-driven uh, inflation spikes. Now, uh, when that sort of collective knowledge takes hold, however, we, we know it, can, it cannot be neutral, and, uh, no, and it, wh what it does uh, and what it did in, the, in this history uh, of the first um, 10, 12, 13 years 
was the was what uh, what uh, Francesco showed in uh, in his slide uh, number five, if I'm not mistaken. So the fact that core inflation, which is you not know, the inflation process uh, that is purged of noise of, th of things that you no know, are erratic and would would not stick, that inflation process was grind grounding lower from uh, one one cycle to the next, and. Um, and if, uh, if Francesco had put you know, the, the price level measured by the core uh, index in his uh, earlier, earlier chart, number three, you would have uh, uh, seen very clearly that that line uh, has st started to depart from the 2% line way before the crisis, way before the crisis, probably already around 2006, 2007. That is, um, yeah, so um, now th that type of regime uh, that was regulating monetary policy and also governing monetary policy uh, conduct in those years has been changed, no? So the 2% was a ceiling, it has become a central target. And as, uh, as Petra has, has said, that is, a, is very important, no? is, a, is an extremely important um, I would say improvement no, in the in the monetary policy regime uh, of the of the ECB. Now that target is symmetric. No, there is no doubt that the governing council, as they said in July, uh, wants to uh, to see inflation um, developing around that target, and that they would consider as equally undesirable deviations on both both sides of the target, not only upside but also downside, but also upside. <laughs> Let me come back to the, to the question. No? Uh, so what I want to say is that, that the new regime has a, um, good chances no, to be a regime, a constitutional framework that will last because is, um, let's say it's good for all seasons. No? It's good for uh, times in which uh, the central bank has to confront and contrast deflationary forces. And, uh, and it's good also for a regime or, or a, let's say a, a makeup of shocks where uh, upside forces, uh, inflationary forces prevail. So that's, that's, that's what I, I, would, I would answer. Well, thank you very much, thank you. Massimo. Uh, Wolfgang, would you like uh, to, uh, we have another, few minutes, not many, but we have another few minutes before uh, closing. Thank you very much, Massimo. Thank you. Uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, I mean, I can just compliment maybe a bit. Uh, Massimo said, said a lot of important things, but also specifically to your, to your nice uh, dis discussions. So maybe on your first point, uh, Francesco, which is deep, like can monetary policy do it alone, right? And you said, uh, even after our book, you didn't get your head around it. And, and of course, this is one, I think, of the key questions. I mean, in the strategy review of the ECB in the academic literature, the fiscal monetary policy interaction, I think is, is still frontier research. So, and in this context, I think there's a lot of open issues uh, still to be tackled. And on the practical level, we see it. I mean, Petra I mentioned it on the, on the redesign of the stability and growth pact, the overarching question, how does in a currency union, fiscal policy and monetary policy act and interact? I think it's, it's, it's super frontier. So definitely not for our book to give the final answer. So you are you're right in your in your puzzlement, uh, Francesco. And then on all these points of, of Petra um, robustness, lacking detail, technical jargon, but um, absolutely. I mean, uh, specifically on new Arabic model. I mean, you you I don't know if you read all the 411 pages. We we resort to it. So there there's reference to it. There's risk analysis that we do with that model. But you're absolutely right. This book could never go into detail and and uh, in cross check as a paper would and. Be assured, we have been challenged by peers in even Eurosystem type of frameworks like the Monetary Policy Committees, where all the national central bank economists challenge us. So, like a paper, we had gone through type of referee processes. Uh, but your point's absolutely well taken. Uh, maybe a third point. I mean, I know you have been working a lot on transparency, uh, Petra. Uh, on the DFR, I think has just been now established as the interest rate to look to. Yeah, the you're right, the MRO has stayed put and the main policy instrument rate-wise was the DFR. I think this has now been understood, but you're right, this was a communication challenge when, when things changed. And maybe final uh, remark um, to the two of you, uh, call for transparency, especially evaluation of staff forecasts. I mean, 
uh, we do look at it at times. I mean, we publish it in the bulletin, like also the comparison to other institutions, to financial markets, to surveys. There was a bulletin article on it, but it, it, we don't do it on a regular basis. So we are kind of halfway between the type of transparency that you advocated and, and, and the central bank being totally opaque on this. So we, we are in, in between, I think. Okay, thank but you. But overall, thank you also from my side. A super, super nice discussion, super helpful comments. And yeah, second edition of the book would definitely have the pandemic and the challenges that are currently there, but uh, I'm not sure if we're yet up for, for writing something new of this, of this caliber. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are just a spot on time. I don't know, uh, Petra, is there any urgent comment uh, that you would uh, want to make? Uh, or, or do no. we, no, thank do you. we <laughs> close uh, here? We thank you very much, uh, of course, uh, uh, Massimo and Wolfgang. Uh, I, I thank you, uh, Petra, uh, for being uh, here. Um, I thank all um, remote participants. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, when it comes to transparency, this book uh, is a great, uh, uh, a great progress in understanding what the ECB does, why it does it, uh, how it does it. Uh, so uh, I think that also from the transparency point uh, that Petra mentioned, uh, this is uh, great progress. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and um, uh, we look forward to the second edition. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.